Hello and welcome to Slack Chats. This is a podcast about Slackware Linux and in particular Slackware ARM because I'm Stuart Winter, I'm the platform architect and, and the developer of that port. And today with us we have Brent Hurl. Hi Brent. Hello. Brent's been contributing to the project for quite some time now. Uh, previously with QMU, but that was quite a while ago, and more recently on the Rock Pro 64 and Pinebook Pro integration for Slackware ARCH64. And working on the Raspberry Pi stuff as well. So perhaps we'll talk about that a little bit today. But in this episode, what we're going to do to begin with is I was just about to sit down and relax and have a break. And I thought, what more of a relaxing, calming thing to do than to write a little bit of documentation for the Rock Pro 64 integrations. So I can start pushing out Slackware ARCH64 to the public. And unfortunately, one of my 32-bit x86 machines, one of my laptops, is so slow. It's mostly to do with the disk, as far as I can tell. But it's so slow that I thought, why don't I just get the Pinebook Pro working and then I can just write it on the Pinebook Pro, running Slackware AR64, documenting the Rock Pro 64. So what you can see on the screen is the U-boot console of my Pinebook Pro. And what I've just done, uh, Brent and I were doing before we started recording, was that initially when you, when you get the Pinebook Pro, it has Manjaro on it, which is what they uh, distribute, uh, the Pine64 company distribute on it. And what you need to do is disable the EMMC, which is where it's stored, where the Manjaro distribution is stored. Um, but unfortunately, at that point, there's nothing, nothing will boot on the machine at all because there's no U-boot in the SPI flash and the, there's nothing on an SD card to boot either. So what I've just done is I've created a, a recovery and an initial installation um, SD image, which you can pop in and power on the... Pine 64, once you've disabled the EMMC, you can power on the Pine 64 and it will then install the Slackware version of U-Boot into the SPI flash and then reboot it. So what you're seeing is, is the is U-Boot has just been rebooted for the first time into uh, the Slackware ARM comp uh, version of, of U-Boot. At least it should be. <laughs> Let's check. Uh, I'm sure it is. And that's why I labeled it with Slackware. There we go, Slackware 99. I don't know why it says Slackware 99. I think there's some truncation going on there. Um, normally it says Slackware ARM, but you can clearly see that that is the right version of U-Boot. So what we're gonna do, so what we're gonna do is I've just taken the Slackware ARCH64 uh, RK3399 generic installer image and I've deed it and I've DD'd it onto the SD card that I'm going to use as the boot partition on this. So let's see what happens when we reset the board or reset the laptop, I suppose I should call it now. It should boot from the SD card, which will have the Slackware installer on it, like you would have seen in the other videos for the Rock Pro 64. And it does. There we go. It has been yeah, kernel boot, though. It recognizes uh, the board. Yeah, it's going to boot this. But it has kernel panics before when I tried this before, but that could be because it uh, had the pipe, it had um, uh, the EMMC wasn't disabled. So I'm hoping that this time it might boot the installer. I'm touching some wood, Brent. I'm touching wood. Oh, it's got further than before. Yeah, this looks like it's, it's working. Yeah. Cool. And let's see, do I have anything on the screen yet? It's on the. <coughs> Oh, no, not yet. I did well. have boots on the screen before, but I don't have, it's, it's gone, the screen's gone weird on the Pinebook Pro. It's kind of got like white lines on it. Like it's got, it's like it's in between a, a mode, like, you know, a screen mode. Weird. <laughs> Is it the serial console's working though? Serial, yeah. Well, I'm going to suggest because I'm going to I'm going to suggest that the Rock Pro 64 is installed over the serial console. It just works, so I'm going to suggest yeah. that we do that, uh, and then later, if it happens to all per, you know work every time on the uh, on the HDMI, I can suggest that as well. But you can see there's something a little bit weird though. Like here, if you if you see that looks 
What is that about? I think that's just corruption on the serial port. Yeah. Because I told you in the, one of the previous podcasts that I booted it, and then every third character or so was missing from here. So I don't know what happened there, but I've reinstalled the laptop that I, that I used, the x86 laptop, to the latest version of Slackware Current on it. And, well, to be honest, that's all I've done, actually. <laughs> it just it just works now, so who knows. I um, haven't been using any x86 for about a month now. I boot everything from Serial Console and... I look at it on the pine book and it's all working good. But I don't know if it's one of your ports or what, but so this okay, so this is I've not used NVME before. So I'm just having a look at what we've got on here. So does it look like it looks got um so I assume on your machine you've got the you've got slash dev dev slash NVME in the in the FS tab, right? Of your booted yep. machine. Disk zero here. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that in, okay. So when one is not okay. So that's not a partition, is it? So okay. So that means I should. Oops. Eight. No. Uh, eight G. Why is it error? Oh, first sector. Oh, hang on. There's something odd here. With the output? Yeah, I reckon there's something. Let me try this again. N, P, 1, yes, first sector. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, do you see what I mean? Look, it's, it's gone a bit... Okay, there's something weird with that. The only thing is I don't have is a I don't have Ethernet for this because I haven't got a um I don't think I have a, an Ethernet adapter in my office. So I've just plugged in an Ethernet adapter to the Pinebook Pro. We do we have no oh, no we don't. Do we have a carrier? No, because I don't think I've got the right cable plugged into it. Is it the yellow cable or the red cable? I think it's the red cable today. <laughs> Do we get a carrier? There we go. Yeah, it's the red cable. Okay. Not the yellow cable. So let's start the SSH server. <laughs> yeah. So you can, in, inside the installer is an SSH server, so you can SSH into it. So that's what we're going to do because I want to see, there's no password by default. So, because I think, yeah, there's some oddities going on with the um, with the serial console there. I don't know if it's the, the settings. It could be just the settings, actually, I've got on screen. It could be that, so I'll have to look at that later. But for the moment, I'll just, uh, at the moment, I'm now SSH'd into the, into the Pinebook Pro, into the Slackware installer, running on the Pinebook Pro. So if I do fdisk with that, Okay. Yeah, this so looks you did end up getting that same drive? Pardon? You got the same drive as I have on mine? Yeah. Yes, I think it might be a larger one, though. Yeah, it, it is. You get the, the yeah, you one. got the smaller one, didn't you? And I thought, well, I'll get the larger one then. Yeah. Then we know whether, whether both of them work. I mean, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's just a different size of yeah. storage. So let's do partition one. Last sector. There we go. That was what was messing up before. So it's 8G. There, yeah, that's better. Type uh, 82PNP A2PW. Right, so there's the disk set up. Q go. Mm. Oh, I haven't got a name for the Pinebook Pro. Ooh. Yeah. Oh. Should I reuse one of my existing names? I, I think don't we'll know call how the feel about that. Huh? <laughs> I don't know how the pine book would feel about that. We're getting someone else's name, the previous board's yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call him Mr. Magoo. <laughs> right.
Nice. It's very bright, this uh, installer here. I'll set the keyboard. Right. There's a swap. So, yes, let's do that. This is the first time that I've run Slackware AR64 on a Pinebook Pro. So, Brent's the only person in the world who's run it before me. <laughs> so, I don't, I'm assuming it's going to look the same as the Rock Pro 64. I was yeah. a test subject, I'm just a guinea pig. <laughs> okay. Format that. So at the moment, I'm just doing what I will document for both the Rock Pro 64 and the Pinebook Pro in terms of the installation. You just keep it simple. Uh, yeah. We have a single root partition and slash boot will be on the SD card. Well, so far it's good actually. It should. Um, oh yeah, uh, resize slash boot. Do I want to do that? Uh, yeah, I will yeah. this time, actually. I guess I'm going to um, reinstall one of the Rock Pro 64s soon, and uh, I will uh, not resize it because I want to write that code to check whether the whether there's sufficient space to even you know consider resizing. So yeah, plus that. if you resize it and it's already been resized, it just kind of says finished. It doesn't really mess anything up. Oh, does it not? Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, I, I tried that. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good to know. I thought it should do. Uh, so yeah, let's resize it. Oh, I need a. Hmm. Okay. It works well. That's not supposed to. Something gone funny there. It should that shouldn't blat over the background. It should be a clear there. Oh well. I'll have a look at that later. So good. That works. Yeah, that's what should happen. <laughs> Let's have a yeah. look at the code on that one. Let's see, we'll make a note of that. Was it the res? Was it yeah? The resizing code needs to clear the screen, doesn't it? Although it doesn't on the, it works fine on the Rock 64. So I don't, it must maybe it's some settings or something in the terminal yeah. emulation. I don't know. We'll just make it clear the screen instead. That will work. Right, so that's done. So let's install over NFS. But in the in the documentation, I'll set it up so that you can install over a local HTTP server using Python. I think. Uh, yeah, let's install everything. Cool. All right. Well, that's. It's working so far. So once this is installed, then Brent, does it? Um, you you do see a all that, and it, it just looks like the regular installer. I mean, I think last week I had to run the OS INIT uh, generator, but it um, it was fine. I mean, it just rebooted fine. Uh, Okay, we shouldn't. What what modules did you add? Oh, I just ran it just to make sure. <laughs> oh, to make a new one, see if it worked. Oh, okay. And the chi root. All right. So when you re when I've rebooted this and it's installed, or rather, once this is installed and I reboot it, do will it just work? Did you have to do anything else to get X working or the console or HDMI or anything like that? No, um, oh, okay. I don't have HDMI, but the screen works on the on the Pinebook. Oh, okay. So it just doesn't work in the installer then. At least yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't for me anyway. Hmm, I mean, okay. I usually leave the, the lid closed when I'm doing it over console so, or serial console. Okay. Yeah, hmm. I didn't really notice that. OK. Well, if it well, seeing as it works inside once the OS is, boot, is booted, it must be just some modules that are missing, I guess. I'm not sure yeah. what else it could be. Well, actually, whilst I'm here, I've got a note in the uh, to do list. Um, ah, yes, is that this is yeah, on, on arm, I have the installer bring up networking by default and, and request an IP with DHCP, whereas here it doesn't. So I need to have a look at that. I can clearly see it doesn't. It's not in there. 
that's probably in X in the X Linux config actually. Although, hmm. Yeah, I'll have to have a look at that. You could make it so it's it's changed in the X Linux cons config because then people can edit it before they boot it. Whereas if it's an SDI flash, it'll bring up the network every time, even if, if there is a network. Oh, what I'm saying? Yeah, this the, yeah, the, all of this stuff isn't isn't configured in U boot. This is purely inside this this is inside of the installer image. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying if somebody decides to change something before they boot it, they can't really do it if it's built into SPI flash. No, no, you can't do that if it's in there, no. Yeah, so if you just edit it on the SD card, it's easier for people to change whether they want this or that. Yeah, so I thought I'll have a look and see where that is, well, where the uh, network configuration is and see if I can put it in to the uh, next installer build. And I've just realized that I'm really fortunate because uh, this machine is the primary builder for AR64 at the moment. It's just finished building the kernel package. It's just been installed on the Pinebook. I'd forgotten that I was building the kernel, actually. Because <laughs> uh, so I've just yeah. uh, downloaded the 5.14.9 that was released today and built it. And that takes about three hours on AR64. So it's currently doing it. So yeah. I hope that it's installed. the Yeah, look, it's got the kernel headers. I hope it got the um, the kernel package. I should check actually. Maybe it didn't. <laughs> Hang on, let's have a look. This is one of the things of doing the development when you when you're installing. I wasn't thinking about that. Uh, where is it? Oh, it's it's, it's MNT, isn't it? No, oh, yeah, it looks like it's fine. It's, yeah, looks good. Okay. Is it in here? Is it a C card skeleton or something? <laughs> oh, yeah, this would be it. This would be it. <clears throat> oh, no, that's. It's in that's the generic. It config yeah oh yeah the installer oh, generic right. yeah oh that's right god it's been it feels like it's been forever that i did all of this it was so intense writing all of this at the time oh there we go yeah it's simply missing okay yeah you will have to move it ah right right okay that's why i've even commented it about why i've explicitly removed it from the config is, is, is the notes here is because I was having trouble at the time with um, HDMI on the Rock Pro 64. OK, that's fine. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to change that because I'm not going to at the moment, I'm not concerned about the at the moment, I'm just going to suggest you install over the serial console. So let's make that. Let's return that. OK. Cool, fixed. That's another job done. Construct, I can strike that off the list. Cool, so the kernel's installing. That is all good. I've been adding that to it for the Raspberry Pi and because I've been installing it headless. Yeah, let's let's talk about the Raspberry Pi. Are you... Okay. So what have you got then? You've got the the latest build of U-Boot that you've built. And then you're setting, OK. I just have to add that to the config for the Raspberry Pi so it boots from the second partition instead of the first. OK. So because um, we jumped straight in here. So what Brent's showing us now, he's been working on getting the Slackware ARCH64 installer working on the Raspberry Pi 4. So, so what you've done then, Brent, you've got the, you built the latest version of U-Boot for it, which you can see is booting right now. Mm -hmm. And you've taken the, you've replicated, essentially replicated what, how it, how it works for the Rock Pro 64 in the Pinebook Pro in terms of the installer. So you've created an SD card image. Mm -hmm. um, and then the. It has a, 
And on the first partition of the SD card, it has the firmware files for the Raspberry Pi. Right. And on the second one, it has the Slack or ARM stuff. And after it's booted, the first partition just is hidden, I guess. So. Okay. And do, does that, in terms of management does and maintenance, does that firmware need to be changed or upgraded? In, if I mean, need? there's probably a way I can have it updated when I build an SD image. I mean, through Git or something. Oh, I mean inside of the OS. So once that, because, because, because the way that you've done it, right, this will presumably offer to resize the partition or what? How's it going to? Well, we it's can see. Interesting. The way you have it, it just kind of skips it. And it works the same way as like they have it going in Sarpy. So, same okay. idea. You just don't have to install the kernel packages after you're done installing Slackware. So. Okay. okay. But the, so the firmware, the firm, the U, the firmware files that the bootloader requires. Do we will we need to manage those from within inside the OS? Ah, uh, yeah, probably. It's probably the way to do it. Okay. Because you can see the first. Um, First partition is right here, and that's with the firmware files. But it's not mounted. Oh, this is the installer, but you get what I mean. Okay. I see. So the 100 meg partition that you've highlighted is where the firmware files are. Yeah. Okay. And then the and balance I, is. I can reboot into it. Oh, I see. So you've already made the file, you've already made the boot partition. I guess the, the full size of the disk, or is that? I just put 100 meg for the firmware, and then oh. I just had the, the second one just fill the rest of it. Oh, before. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's what I've done as well, right? Yeah. So the boot partition comes as about 900 megs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I guess. Well, in terms of management, I guess it it really depends on whether you ever really need any more boot firmware. I suppose. I don't know whether the boot firmware has any relevance once you've got through the bootloader. Well, I mean, it uses the kernel that you've provided. So, and when I have it copy over to the SD card, when I'm making the image, it removes the Raspberry Pi kernels from there. So. Raspberry Pi kernels, what do you mean? Yeah, they provide one for each, um, like there's one for the Raspberry Pi 3, one for the four different images of kernel image. And you can see here, I've saved U-boot to that partition. So this is a basically an independent partition after it boots. Yeah. And it's separate. Okay, yeah, so that's, yeah, okay. So we probably don't need, unless for some reason you need to update that firmware because the system won't boot properly in the bootloader. I guess you probably don't need to touch it. Mm -hmm. And I have it booting off the USB 3 on my installation. OK. So it, it works the way that I think most people will use it so far. Oh, OK. But I don't have an ability, the way to like install the SD card or anything, so. OK. So, we'll so the way that this. Why is it so? There, are, I can see the other Raspberry Pi files there, the two and three and zero and so on. Mm -hmm. well, presumably, you don't need. You could delete those from the partition because you're not running. Yeah. Okay. But does that also imply, to any degree, that this that we could have a single image for the Raspberry? Pi? And a single SD card image for the Raspberry Pi that would work on the ver on Raspberry Pi three as well. Yeah, it boots on there too. I just don't. I I don't have the patience to wait for the the RAM disk to load in the memory. It's kind of slow. Yeah, it's quite large. Yeah, and it only has one gig of memory, so I don't oh, know. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, so well. The bootloader, the boot code, all that stuff on the first partition, and then it loads the 
installer and it just takes forever no that's not because of the lack of ram though that's something to do with the the speed at which it's accessing the sd card it's like the old um the 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 ariu fan boot um the, the sd image that i was originally using that was incredibly slow loading in in its rds but as soon as i upgraded uboot it was fast so this oh. might be just some it might be that you can get a newer version of the bootloader or change some settings or something and it's just fast i don't know yeah i've, I've never used a raspberry pi 3 i'm not gonna i'm not gonna either no <laughs> and i figured the newest model's the four so i should focus on that first so. yeah definitely okay uh, I wasn't watching. Is this still the installer booting? This is booting the operating system that I've installed on an external USB drive. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, once that's booted, you can show me um, around. Yeah. And I give thought you a of, of, of the system. first partition in boot, but as like a partition like boot slash firmware. Yeah. And then like have a utility that can update that or something. Yeah. That's what we talked about, wasn't it? Yeah, if if that's necessary. I mean, you could also just mount it under, or could you? Yeah, you should be able to just mount it slash boot slash RPI firmware or something and then have a package, have a separate package that writes into that location. Yeah. Um, the only thing is that would be slightly complicated because you need to make sure when you install the package or upgrade it that the, if if the Raspberry Pi should if it is a Raspberry Pi you're installing it on, so if the target is if it is a Raspberry Pi that you're running it on, is that that partition is actually mounted when the package uh, is deployed on the system because otherwise it would end up writing it into slash boot itself rather than it everywhere <laughs> onto the partition. So that would that would complicate the management of that. Probably just a separate. Maybe maybe you would never make a package because if it's just firmware for boot, you can just manage it manually, I guess. Or, yeah, or like, just yeah, like directory in there, and you can pull it down every once in a while, type of thing. Yeah, or like you said, just make a tool to do it instead. Probably yeah. better, that, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, but there's really no reason to update it once it's been booting, uh, unless there's a bug. So. Yeah, that's that's my that's that's my attitude too towards this stuff. I guess that's what is that what the RPI I don't know if you know about it but is that what the RPI firmware update tool was called that the firmware yeah, RPI dash update yeah ah. is it? okay it updates all the files and tells you not to reboot in the middle of it and okay stuff. yeah maybe okay. we can take and modify it <laughs> yeah well initially just take the files and put them on the on the SD card within the SD card image like we're doing with the um, Rock Pro 64 Oh well, actually, that's different because there's a DD into the onto the actual um, device, but yeah, something like that. Actually, What's I think I had trouble trying to get it to use the right console when I booted, and that's ah. what happened there. Yeah, I can see that. Yes, but it works uh, on HDMI, so okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. You. Nobody... Yeah, you need to. Can you SSH into it from elsewhere? Oh, I don't have a network cable attached to it. It was connected oh. to Wi-Fi. Oh, maybe, yeah. One because the problem is you won't you won't be able to show me because otherwise, because the the, the very issue is is uh, with loading the with, with the get TTY. It's yeah. not bring, be able to bring it up probably because it's just got the wrong port number. I mean the wrong um, interface. Right. I do remember putting some code into the uh, one of the uh, I've forgotten which package it is now. Yeah, I'd have to check with a port scan to find it. <laughs> I don't think it's connecting to this Wi-Fi that I have up right now, so I'd have to boot up my other thing. I don't know, um, but I think if I can change it from U-boot, it should fix it. I don't know what port. Yeah, you need to see what the what's configured in the etc. init tab there. I've got in the sys5 init scripts package some code f to handle the Rock Pro 64 and set the correct interface. Um, although it should also work for the Raspberry Pi because it does it it has supported it for quite some time. It should set the right thing there, but maybe the settings are just wrong. 
don't know. If you can get into the machine and cap the, because this you're never going to get a login prompt here, because that's what the the very problem is. Yeah, I'll plug it into my the hard drive into my computer and just edit it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this reminds me of when I was originally doing the port. I kept having to take the hard drive, this IDE drive out of the RISC PC and plugging it into an x86 to figure out what happened and then fixing it. Well, that was hard. It was, yeah, yeah. a little, little ruining of SD cards doing that for me. Um, uh, so I don't know what I would change here. Maybe. Uh, well, you haven't got. Uh, that's. Oh yeah. That's, okay. So. You, that's the hard drive. Ah, uh, okay. It could be that. In the case of the Rock Pro 64, that's TTYS2, and if you set it to anything other than that, you get the same problem. So I don't know what that is. The pro but, but without this, you won't get a login either. So you won't be able to log into the machine. Simply won't get a login prompt on the console without that. Yeah. Uh, what is it on your media yet? Yeah. Um, probably. That what you could do, Brent, is just is just boot into the um, SLK PBS. The pre, sorry, the pre, the pre-boot environment. Yeah. And then find out what the device is for for this, because as I said it could be TTYS one, or it might even be AMA zero. I'm not sure. Yeah, boot into the. Can you? Yeah, I can, can do that. that. Yeah, because you can change the X Linux config, can't you? To. Uh, I just yeah. have to move this. Okay. People are getting a view of what we do. <laughs> I guess I got to edit the SD card then this time. Brent, I'm meditating on the feedback noise. It's like the um, it's like a sort of high level om. That's what it's called, the the partition. They no, no, the noise of the thing. I'm meditating on the noise of the feedback. I can hear om. It's like, a, it's like a, those meditation bowls, you know, the ones that you have, uh, like a rubber um, a little stick around the edge and you know, this sort of this noise emanates from them. What do you hear? You hear me typing? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I can hear <laughs> <laughs> Trying to do uh, this fast. So what would you think I would put here then? Just put SLK PBS after it. Oh, yeah. Well documented this this file, isn't it? What? I said it's very well documented this file. Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay. It's quite an intense period, wasn't it? The original, the initial development of this. Yeah, it was a lot of messing around with U-boot. <laughs> oh goodness, yeah. <laughs> quite good at U-boot now, though. Yes, we can do it. All right. We at least you can. <laughs> I've probably forgotten most of it now already. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, I do tend to document extensively what I learned in script form, and you know, so so I never have to think about it again, and I can just you know forget it with confidence. I don't actually know if the PVS works just like PVS. Of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> of course it works. So at the moment, then you've got okay. So you're setting, you're telling U-Boot to find where to the find the second partition. Yeah. And what happens? It what happens if it doesn't? If you don't do that? I think there's a. Say we put it to one like it is by default. Ah. Oh well, okay. It won't it find. It does. It's the drive. We can't boot it. But I thought that if you look at the script that run the U-Boot script that runs or the brother that searches for X Linux, I'm pretty certain it uh, enumerate. Yeah, there it is. The scan for boot. It has like a chained script. The way that it boots, if I remember right, work, if I remember correctly, is that it sort of works in a chain where it calls various different parts of itself. Like, yeah, yeah. like run boot. Yeah. So for but the default config for U-Boot, um, like the dev config, 
it sets it to dev num as zero and then or one and it sets distro boot part to one but doesn't look for two ever oh okay understood okay yeah it's okay so we just need to figure out how to edit the u-boot config during the uh so that when it's shipped it works with the, with the right setting mm -hmm. i think that's quite easy to be honest I actually could have rebooted into the installer and just edited things there, but <laughs> instead uh, yeah, 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 logging yeah. everything. <laughs> well, that's uh, yes, that's another option. You could have done that actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you just do ls slash dev slash tty's capital s and see, press tab. Yes, it's probably it might not be tty zero s zero. Then it might be. Uh, S2 or S1. Um, I'm just thinking how you can fix that. Or rather, how you can test it. I'm going to mount it in here, but I don't think you can mount it in the preview shell. <laughs> mount what? The hard drive for the Raspberry Pi. Oh, yeah, of course you can. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to boot the OS. Oh, okay. Not there. Hmm. If you do slash, if you do cat slash proc slash cmd line, what have you got in there? Right, so you want it to dev slash sda2 then that you want to mount. No mount. Yeah, that's because there's no directory called m. It's, it, oh, yes, there is. Yeah. You put. I think it's because it needs a kernel driver, but I forget what it is. So. Oh, yeah. is this? This is oh, the first shell. Oh, okay. Show. You're right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I forgot. Yeah, there's different stages of it. Okay. There we go. Now it'll work. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, Brent? I actually haven't used this before. <laughs> Oh, you haven't? I had to use it a lot, actually. <laughs> I wrote it all, and then I used, because I was developing it as I was writing it, I was fixing what I wanted to get done for the Rock Pro 64 as I was writing the entire uh, um, boot system. And so I developed it all. I knew it worked, but I never actually used it. So it's nice to see you using it. That's why oh, yeah, I, I had to realize that I forgot about the two stages because even though I, I know it works and I wrote it, I, I've never actually run through it. So I didn't get the, I didn't uh, expect it. Okay. So. This, right? Yeah. I don't, but you can try TTYS1, but I don't know if that will actually work. It's probably <laughs> easier to, I'll tell you what, hold on. If you, let me just try something. Um, I was just trying to think through how you could just test it. This, you can probably just run it from uh, there directly. I do remember playing around this with this extensively when I got the Rock Pro 64 because I couldn't get the thing to work. <laughs> yeah, I think I wasn't using the preboot shell for a while with the Raspberry Pi, but then I figured out which drivers it needed the hard way by rebooting over and over and from the installer and then I started using this and it was like a lot easier but yeah it is um I mean you could just try booting it now and see what happens and, it, and then indeed probably the easiest thing to do uh I mean I have an idea I think you can probably test it directly. This is what it does when it loads the Bluetooth. I remember now, that's why I wasn't using the, the preboot shell. It takes forever. I plug in an Ethernet cable, maybe I can get a shell on. Yeah, that's definitely going to be the easiest way of fixing it, yeah. Uh, what you can probably do, I'm just thinking how you can replace in its S0, because that's what I did when I was testing it uh, on the Rock Pro 64. I just made it open a shell 
uh, yeah, there's an easy fix, Brent. If you go back into the, if you reboot it again, the, the Raspberry, oh, it is, is that the one? Yeah. Okay. I guessed it right. Okay. I was going to say, I just realized the easiest fix for it is to, instead of, if you open up the, um, do a D message and grep for TTY in there, and you'll see which one that it thinks that there, there is there. No, grep for TTY. Oh, 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 okay, so it is, oh, there you go, TTY AMA0. Yeah. Right, so it could, okay. So what did you set it? Have a look at the init tab at the moment. What did you set in that? No, no, that's not the setting. That that setting in the init tab. Oh, I see what you're saying. I've got to reboot it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's got nothing to do with this with the serial setting. If you look at open up the init tab as root, so you can edit it. Sudo. Yeah. What? I'm lazy. I don't like to type passwords. <laughs> at least not on a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> Okay, where's the S0? Okay, so it's TTY. Oh, change it to TTY S1. Do that now. And then uh, that should that might fix it, actually. Just save that. And then uh, kill all dash hub in it. See if that works. We need to do that as root, though. Oh, yeah, we got, got the fancy command sudo. You know you can do control and A, by the way, and control and E to jump forwards and backwards in the line. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. God, that drive me crazy if I didn't know that. You'd have to be moving the cursor key all the time. I'm actually confused what I'm typing because the Pine Book has the little, on the arrow keys, you can switch back and forth easy between the end and the beginning by hitting the FN key. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, right, yeah, now now I reopen a serial console. Screen, yeah, that one. Try again. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so thanks for that. Can you do? You've just given me some work to do. <laughs> Let me change the uh, the sys5 init scripts uh, pack package then. So can you tell me what is in the proc device tree model file? Oh, can you just show me on the screen actually? Yeah, device dash tree. Oh, it's no device dash tree. Oh, device tree. Okay. Yeah. yeah slash model, and then I can. I can make the sys5 init scripts package support this properly. OK, so Raspberry Pi 4 model B. Should we just go with Raspberry Pi 4? Yeah. That'll yeah. Be cool. And that's TTYS1, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'll leave that on the screen at the moment while I just type it into the thing. No, I don't know. Raspberry, Raspberry Pi 4. Oh, that'll do, yeah. Oh, I need to put that in quotes. Okay. Can you check uh, if have you got? Has that machine got internet access? Yeah, it's connected. Okay, cool. Hold on a sec. Or you mean the Raspberry Pi? Yeah. I just want you to test a uh, bit of code, seeing as you've got the machine open. Yeah. It's going to be a really long podcast, Brent. I know. This is how open source is done. If you open up a web browser, oh, yeah. maybe just maybe just to grab the URL. And so you can paste it in there and W get it onto the Raspberry Pi. If you just go to armed.slackware.com. No, not uh, armed as in armed. Oh, armed. It's armed with armed and with, Sorry, with guns. I didn't, I didn't hear you. Then do slash TMP slash RPI dot SH. Can you just download that script onto the Raspberry Pi and run it? And just, I just want to make sure that the match condition works for the Raspberry Pi whilst we've got one in front of us. Oh, I've, I've made it. It should be TTYS1 anyway. So I've made, that's a mistake I've made there. If you just put the star outside the last speech mark, it should work. It should say TTYS1 when you run it again. I just realized. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Let me fix that in the in the um, the sys5 init scripts package then. So the next time you install it on the Raspberry Pi, it'll just work. Mm. Awesome. Okay, and T2. done. I rebuild that. Thanks for that. 
no problem. Yeah, so now next time you install it, you'll get the login prompts without having to hack around on it. It's when you find things to break. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> Let's rebuild sys 5 init scripts then. I think I've got a. I'm going to do a release maybe tomorrow. Let's have a look at the system then. What's in the etc. FS tab? Oh yeah, by the way, you can do control and W to clear the line. You don't need to press backspace. Uh, control and W for wipe, control and A for beginning, control and E for end. Doesn't work because I'm in a screen some, session. Oh, <laughs> uh, you must have some weird, or you've got a, a different uh, console setting perhaps, I don't know. Yeah, this is okay. just D for Red Hat, it's nothing. There's uh, no custom. Control and W, yeah. oh well, I don't know. Um, Normally it is on everything I ever used. Let's have, so what's in here? So you've got, okay, so cool. Yeah, the labeling really helps there, doesn't it? It makes takes all of the complexity, the you know the labeling of the boot partition takes all the complexity of of determining where it is and leaves it to the uh, to the kernel. Mm -hmm. cool. And I think I have no slack. I think I have something like that for the Raspberry Pi. How do you see the label? What do you mean, though? Uh, for the boot partition, uh, but not the boot partition, the firmware partition. But I don't know if we want that mounted. I don't know. But... No, I don't think. Well, probably not at the moment, no. Initially, if you don't need to touch it inside of the Slackware OS, and like you said before, unless it breaks, or there's something utterly amazing about a newer version of it just leave it alone it's it's just boot code to yeah it's for like a bios <laughs> yeah we just leave it then but right. i thought you said that the is doesn't it need to be a fat partition for for that yeah that's why i have it this way because i yeah. couldn't get it to make simlinks because fat doesn't support simlinks so cool. yeah. yeah so it's, it, i think it's perfect then so what's in slash boots is that that should be all standard stuff right <gasps> LS. It's just standard. Nothing Ooh. in local either. Awesome. Oh yes, because you gave me the modules, didn't you, for the Raspberry mm -hmm. Pi? So, That's so all those in are in. Okay. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, and it works. What's the how many? What's the CPU info look like? The what? A uh, proc CPU info. Oh, that, yeah. What, what do you <laughs> have in there? Okay. Oh. Oh, why is there only... Do a free dash M. N? Uh, M for M. For, oh. uh... Yeah. So you've only got four gigs shown, but it's an eight gig machine. It's only four gigs. I don't have an eight gig. Oh. I got mine before they put that out, I think. Oh, okay. I thought it was hidden or or, or, or it was, wasn't addressable or something. Oh, okay. So I've got an 8 gig version on mine, so I should be able to. So basically, Brent, from what you've shown me, I should be able to get my Raspberry Pi working as well. Yeah, I think okay. that the script I sent you yesterday should make the image for it. Okay. Oh, yeah. And it, it uses a generic ARM64 config in U-Boot, so... Okay. It should work on the threes as well. Oh, cool. Okay. And okay, right. The, the, now I understand why you had so many files in the in the directory. Um, I was like, why what all this binary gunk? It's yeah, I was just trying. To just I was like, you know what? I'm not going to even bother scripting that. I'm just going to copy everything. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, com but yeah, it can be cleaned up though that because there's a quite a lot of garbage in there. Like you're not going to put Slackware AR64 onto a Raspberry Pi one, so yeah. there's, there's quite a bit of crud that can be removed from there. But yeah, whatever. or the zero, yeah, that's not even yeah seven. That's like six or something. Oh, okay. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, there's a bit cleaner. But basically, yeah. So I sh I can do that, and then I can also unless you want to figure it out for yourself. But I think uh, if we can just make the U boot so that it automatically has the you know it boots with the correct 
um, variable sets. I'm pretty certain it's easy to do, actually. I think even there's some code in one of the scripts that, that you, you've already edited that does that. Yeah, you can drop the config into that config directory. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Have you not done that already, then, for to set it? No, that was the next thing on my list. Ah, oh, great, all right. Oh, well, this looks cool. This is exciting. So I can actually yeah, get around to the Yeah, pretty much automated as it is, so. All right. This Even I didn't de-build so that I didn't have to wait so long for you to build. <laughs> yeah, it does take a little while, doesn't it? <laughs> long All enough right. to be in swing. Yeah. Okay. And can you do what's df-h look like on here? What what um? <laughs> I have a terabyte disk on it. Okay, so you've installed onto the USB drive, right? Mounted a hard or whatever it is, the SSD or a disk on, on, on the USB yeah. interface. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so back. you're using an adapter with that, are you? Yeah. Just the USB adapter, yeah. Okay. Oh cool. So this is okay, this is sounding um um this is sounding good to me. I because, think like if someone got one of the hats for the Raspberry Pi, they could plug in an NVMe disk too. So Okay. Yeah, this is looking really good because from what you've shown me here, this is looks like it's in line with the original design of which for the rock pro 64 in terms of the way that it boots the way that you it's presented the way you can install it and use usb adapters to just connect a hard drive you can use nvme so it's actually this looks to me like it's really it fits in nicely already with the ecosystem that i've developed and the architecture yeah, really yeah. To see that. that's why i was trying to make it that way thanks a lot for doing this brent it's really good mm -hmm. to see this is proof that it's worked. So I've developed this plug-in system where you can easily add a hardware model, and you've done it in what less than a week. I did it in like two days. I didn't. I hardly spent that much time on it. It wasn't that hard. You've taken the scripts that I've done. You've extended them to build a U-boot for the Raspberry Pi, and then make an SD card image using the same with you know, with a few changes to the script. You've given me the the, the drop-in file to load load the correct kernel modules for this hardware model. And that's about it. And you've tested it. If you really wanted to push it, you could make it so the Raspberry Pi 3 works with the old arm. <laughs> you could, you um, could make it so it works with 32-bit, too, that script. It's me this morning. I thought um, I could do something like that with, with arm. But I thought I don't want to go and change the way any of the documentation or the way it's installed for the ARM v7. It just doesn't make sense. Even yeah. though I'd like to make it aligned with ARCH64, the thing is, is that it might not, because I had that problem with on the Rock Pro 64 when I I installed U-Boot to the, you know, as, um, I forgot the, the terms for it now, but, you know, it's outside of the partition table. So it was within certain sectors that the, uh, um, or whether it's within a certain area on the disk where the where the uh, Rock Pro 64 would find the um, uh, the U boot code, so it was DD'd into there, and then you had the partition with the file system on the kernels and all that stuff. But I mean, it worked. But until you started writing to slash boot, and then it would the, it just wouldn't boot anymore after that because the, something got corrupt. And uh, so I was a bit. I'm not sure I want to go down that route. But I did think about it. But at the moment, though, certainly, like the Raspberry Pi 3, if anyone really is interested in that. You yeah, could... I'm probably going to just trash mine. They're just not worth it. <laughs> I've done so many things on them, they're just kind of worn out. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I'm Well, I'm going to be have, quite happy having my Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gig of RAM. That'd be quite nice to see how it works as a desktop machine actually even better than rock pro 64 but only because it's got more ram which is better mm -hmm. for web browsing yeah firefox is a monster with ram isn't it what did you say monster. i said firefox is an absolute monster with ram it just eats everything yeah it does yeah. more than a few tabs and i'm swapping yeah it's pretty hungry for ram isn't it um I remember running Internet Explorer on Solaris at university, and it was just, it was like eating, the machine only had 256 meg of RAM, and it ate all of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember the Raspberry Pi 1 was just like 
horrible. I tried to run some kind of media center on it. Oh, and yeah. I was running it off of an SD card. <laughs> so oh, it was God, just not going to sound good. <laughs> well, this looks, thanks, Brent. This looks really good. So I, I look forward to seeing the rest of the, the, the changes. And I can, once I've done the Rock Pro 64, Inst a documentation and got that working i'll have a look at the raspberry pi 4 stuff as well let's finish off this podcast so the pinebook pro has now installed so we're just running through the final post installation checks so do i want to flash it yes i do even though i've only just flashed the one recently but the idea behind this is that the the initial or recovery image i'll probably never update it it'll just be whichever version, so that you can then boot the installer off of the SD card, and then you can flash the latest version that's going to be contained within the SD images. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll just say yes. Do I want to remove the installer? Yes, I do want to remove the installer. Uh, what did I call it? Mr. Magoo. Uh, uh, yeah, we can use Network Manager, I suppose. Uh, no, I'll be having that as well. Need my RPC. No, you're, you're, uh, um, yeah. Which are you using? Are you using KDE or XFCE? I've been using both, switching back and forth to test stuff, just to see how the speed is and stuff. And I think oh. XSpice is a little faster, but yeah, it would be KDE's. Ooh, that's interesting. That looks. It must be. A, yeah, this is to do with the terminal setting because that's not. All right, so let's see what happens here then. Oh, it's oh, this is the serial console. That's gone crazy. Yeah, that's that's U-boot set to 1.5 MIPS instead of. Yeah, this this is the issue, right? If I let's kill this screen. If I fine, right? If I actually change it to oops. If I change it to this one, oh, hold on. It's set to the Raspberry Pi stuff. <laughs> oh, oh, am I? Might have, uh, let's just try that again. I think it might have got confused by what I was doing with the uh, console. Oh, no, that's not worked. Look. Ah. You added the USB stuff? No, this is U-Boot not finding the... Um... It does that sometimes when you reset. You have to cold boot sometimes. Really? Yeah, on the Raspberry Pi 2. It just does that for some reason. Oh, okay. I'll do that. Later. Not always, just sometimes. <laughs> oh, you're right, Brent. Thanks. It hasn't been doing it as much since I got the case for the Rock Pro. Uh, okay. It's mostly when everything's running off of like USB, I think. So. Oh, well, this is the Pinebook Pro, so. Yeah. But do you have anything plugged into USB? Yeah, I do actually. I have the Ethernet adapter. Yeah, that's. It. That I plugged in. That's a thought, actually. You don't need to buy the um, the Pinebook Pro USB docking station just for the Ethernet because you can just use an adapter like I've got. Yeah, I was That's... all excited to use the HDMI though. <laughs> yeah, I have... oh, speaking of HDMI, it's come up now. Oh, I'll show you actually. So just for the video, that should. Oh, why have I not got a? Uh... Oh, okay, that's not right. Do you get to log in prompt on your over the serial port on your on your Pinebook Pro? Um, I don't know. I haven't used it in a long time because the screen works better. So. I'd have to try it out. Um, you mean booting from a different machine in, in, in a, a screen session? No, like here, this is a serial console, and it should have a, unless it's stuck on something, it should have a, uh, a login prompt on here. Maybe the, the, um, the serial interface name is different or something. But that doesn't matter. I'll have a look at that in a bit. Yeah. So, as you can see, there is the Pinebook Pro sitting on my cabinet with the Ethernet adapter I used to install 
to, to install the OS of, so I could NFS mount it. DC Whitehead 2. Oh, can you actually see what I'm typing? I can see the screen a little bit, yeah. Ah. All right, let's restart in it. There we go. There's, let's restart. There you go. Now I'm going to restart in it so that it loads the, uh, the config. Yeah. And then. It's a tricky little thing you did. What's that? Restarting a knit like that? I never, never did that. Ah. Oh, there we go. Look, it wasn't it wasn't set properly in the init tab. So what I'll do. Oh, this is brilliant. So I'm now logged in over. Oh, this is a serial console, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, this this is funky. Wow. OK. Whoa. Hang on. Yeah. OK, there's something odd about the Yeah, the serial console setting here is just not right. But it's also. Oh, 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 here's the thing. So. Uh, wow, that's, that's, <laughs> that is hard. This is, this is hard work. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, harder than doing everything else, trying to get the, the serial consoles to work. But that's why I was trying to find one that would like just work. You could recommend for people to buy it. Actually, so what I'm going to do in here is if I just change this, the do int script for the sysby bin it script, which is where I've literally just added the Raspberry Pi that we were looking at earlier. So there we go, Pi 64, Rock Pro 64, and then that will now support. That will now set it correctly the next time we reinstall on the Pinebook Pro as well. Done. All right. So you won't need that setting in, in uh, Sys Linux. Or uh, the no, no, the, no, this is just setting it in init tab. So yeah. it sets the correct, so it, it'll automatically set it when you install. Oh, oops. It'll automatically set it when uh, when the package is installed during the in, during the installation of Slackware. So when you boot it, it won't say, in, you know, it won't say uh, S0 is respawning too quickly. It will just work yeah. cool. like it does on the Rock Pro 64. <laughs> awesome. So that, I'm pleased with that. I'm just going to quickly make see if X works. Oh, your computer, computer clock is wrong. I assume this does have a um, a. Uh, oh, I should get the Wi-Fi working as well, actually. I assume that works, does it? Yeah, it does. I use it all the time. Oh, cool. All right. Oh, uh, Bluetooth works too. <laughs> cool. There we go. So there's Firefox. <laughs> Of XFCE running on the Pinebook Pro. Yeah. I think I have posted some. Oh uh, no. <laughs> Drop the camera. That's been a really good session. Uh, thanks a lot, Brent. It's been a very long hackathon. Uh, it was going to be quite simple, but I've now got the Pinebook Pro working. So thanks a lot for that, Brent, for talking me through that. Yeah. I can now document it. I just need to make a note of. What was it? I need to, about the cold, the cold booting. Yeah. So I'll just say once the installation is done, just hold down the power, just power it off, and then power it back on yeah. again. You have to wait about like eight to ten seconds to power it off. Yes, that's right. Yes, correct. You have to hold it down. Yeah. Ten seconds or so. Cool. And then it will it, it will boot back in. Well, that, that's really, really cool. So that's now working. So I can use that to finish writing the Rock Pro 64 documentation. And I can even write, I may as well at the same time, then I will write the Pinebook Pro documentation as well. I'm just, I was waiting for my adapter, uh, the docking station, I mean, but um, I don't need to because I've got the, I've got it installed now using a USB Ethernet. Yeah. Adapter. Um, and then you've shown me that the Raspberry Pi 4 is working. So it's all coming together now nicely, isn't it? Yeah, I was just telling people that I know around here that it's almost over. You got it working. Indeed. And I wasn't expecting to come out of the of the gate with uh, three different devices, actually. So, um, yeah, I would, yeah, that's really cool. So once I've done these two things, um, 
I will then look at the Raspberry Pi 4, and you probably would have moved on a little bit uh, when I get there. And then I can probably just do another one of these and install it, and it's all happy days. <laughs> I um, I have an Orange Pi coming in the mail that I'm going to get working 64-bit. So. Oh, cool. Well, you can show me about that once you get that. Mm-hmm. All right, cheers, Brent. Thanks a lot for this, and uh, yep. no see you in the next podcast. All right, later. Cheers, Have a good night. Bye. Bye.